I want to share the story of, of how I came into YWAM, and before that, how I met Howard Malmstead, the co-founder of the University of the Nation. And it just hit me fairly recently that I met Howard um, when the University of the Nations was without form and void, but the Spirit was moving over the face of the waters. In other words, God had not yet spoken to Lauren and Howard about giving YWAM a university. Um, but Howard was such an exceptional person, and of course we know how exceptional Lauren is. But there were, as I, as I uh, know the university world a little bit, I know the education world a bit, when I think of how the Lord found one of the only very well-known university professors in the world who could have worked with Lauren to start a university out of YWAM, that that's just, it just blows my mind even more today than it did before. Um, and the Lord uh, gave me the privilege of, of being the one to, put, to draw these two together. Let me tell you how that happened, because I think there are some lessons for us. And one of the lessons being, of course, that the Lord prepares his key people to do, to do major worldwide ministries. He prepares them, he prepares us throughout our entire lifetimes. And he had obviously been preparing Howard for this his whole life, before he met Lauren at the age of around 55, I think it was, or maybe even 53. And the Lord has his people out there that he has prepared. And we just need to be praying for them, that the Lord would raise them up, and we need to be sensitive to how he leads us to, to draw them in. So I was a brand new Christian, finishing my last year at University of Illinois. And in this Bible study group of uh, students my age, like mid-20s, and we had questions about the Holy Spirit. And we asked our university Bible study leader to teach us about the Holy Spirit. And she said, well, I can't really do that. We found out later it's because although she was a Pentecostal, InterVarsity at that time was anti-charismatic. And if you joined InterVarsity staff, you had to sign a paper saying that you would not discuss your charismatic or Pentecostal experience ever in your ministry with InterVarsity. And she was, she was abiding by her commitment. Many missions still have that requirement today. Anyway, she said, why don't you go talk to this pastor? He'll teach you about the Holy Spirit. And a couple of us were already going to this church. And so we said, sure. So we went to the pastor as a group and said, would you teach us about the Holy Spirit? And he said, sure. And he taught us. And then he sent us away with an assignment. It Read and notice every time the Holy Spirit is mentioned in the whole book of Acts. Come back and we'll talk about it. By the way, he told me, he told us two things about this Spirit, three, that I think are, are still incredibly important. One is that the Holy Spirit is a person, not an it, not a force. It's a person. The, the two other things we know from the New Testament are that the Spirit can be quenched and the Spirit can be grieved. Quenched, in other words, held down from working among us or grieved away from us. Those are very important principles and tell us a lot about the Spirit. So anyway, then the pastor says, well, I have an idea for your next Bible study meeting. Why don't you invite this couple to come to speak to you. They're Presbyterians like you are. Several of us were Presbyterians. And he said, um, he's a professor of chemistry at the University of Illinois. And he and his wife have just had an experience with the Spirit. Why don't you invite them? So he said, yeah, okay, we, we'll invite them. I forget, you know, I don't think I was the one who actually phoned them. But anyway, they came, I was there. 
and they shared their testimony, and they were just uh, delightful people. Um, and we had a wonderful evening and asked them all our questions. And, and toward the end of the evening, the Mrs. Momstead said, well, I have two daughters, and I would love for them to meet some Christian young people like you. Because they weren't saved yet, the two daughters. Or maybe they are just getting saved or something. Anyway, I thought to myself, if your daughters are as pretty and vivacious and intelligent and spiritual as you are, Mrs. Malmstead, I would like to meet them too. So a few weeks later, I went to the this Pentecostal church prayer meeting, midweek missionary prayer meeting, and I see Howard Malmstead there with a beautiful young lady, and uh, I thought to myself, aha, this must be one of the daughters. So her parents had told her about meeting these Christian young people, and her dad must have mentioned that's one of them back there. I was in, my prayer group was meeting in the back of the church, they were meeting in the front. And um, she came up and introduced herself, and that's how I met Cynthia. I asked her out on a date, which was disastrous, because I liked, on a date I liked dancing to rock music. She hated rock music and the whole atmosphere that goes along with those kind of dance places. And so she came back home after that date and told her parents she was never going out with me again. <laughs> but we kept running into each other at church. It was... Um, early, early spring of 1972. And we would talk, and she had questions about the Spirit, and I was able to answer some of her questions because I had just had my experience with the Spirit. And then she asked me over for lunch one day after church, and we had lunch at her house. And, and we started attending every event at church that summer. Every time the church opened its doors, which was several times a week, they had nine different outreach programs going that year. They had visitation. You would go visit the guests who'd come to church. They had uh, prison ministry, which we were part of, migrant worker ministry, neighborhood ministry, park ministry, door-to-door -door ministry, all this stuff going on, plus midweek prayer meetings, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And we were at that church all the time. And... The birds were singing, the lilacs were in bloom, and we fell in love. I was also praying, what do I do next, Lord? Because I was finishing university that term, getting my bachelor's, and had, had no idea of the Lord's will. And I wanted to be an archaeologist, so I wanted to go to graduate school in archaeology. But my grades were so bad, I knew I would not get accepted, and I didn't have any money anyway. And I couldn't get a scholarship, even if I did get in, because my grades were so bad. So I was, I was praying and asking God, how do I, what do I do now? And as I started praying that prayer, a guy came to our church, the cousin of our pastor, and shared about why we're meeting missionaries in Europe. The guy's name was David Boyd. And they had just begun the outreach teams to the military, U.S. military, YWAM was running coffee bars on several different um, army bases in western Germany. And he shared about the need. He shared that miracles were happening. And, but we had this open door. There are 300,000 U.S. military people in Germany, and they're miserable. There was a wave of uh, drug use among the young men, followed by Satanism. Satan worship, and then suicide. And the army was, had no idea what to do with this. And they were so desperate, they, they actually invited YWAM to come onto any of the bases that we could, every base we could find, field a team for. And they would give us a room right on the base to hold the coffee bar in the evenings and on weekends. And they would let the YWAMers sleep in the base chapel on, in the basement. They had bathroom facilities down there. And they would give the YWAMers enough money to 
be able to pay for meals at the, at the soldiers' dining hall. So being good YWAMers, instead of going three times a day, we would go once a day and save the, the money the rest of the time. That's how we made it through the year. Anyway, I heard about all this, and I thought, well, that's wonderful, but I'm not going to do that because I just got out of the Army, and I'm no way I'm going back in to live on a, on a military base, even if I'm not in uniform. A military base is the last place I want to be, and I do not want to leave Cynthia and leave my family. And um, they were asking a one-year commitment besides. So I said, no way. I know that can't be God's will. But each time I prayed, what do I do next? The answer I got was YWAM. And I'd fast again, and the answer was YWAM. And I'd resist the devil, and the answer was YWAM. And um, this went on for, for months. And I came to the place one Sunday where I was driving a girl around to give her testimony in three different churches. She'd just done a YWAM outreach in Chicago. Signed up to give her testimony in three churches, but couldn't drive. So she asked me if I'd drive her. So I was driving her around and listening to her testimony over and over. But what struck me that first church was they sang a song that we sing in English, an old hymn called Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. And then the second service we went to, they sang the same song. And I thought, no, that's a coincidence. The third service we were going to was my Presbyterian church. Um, and I knew they'd not sung that song there in at least one century because it talked about Jesus too much. But we go to that church service and they sing, Trust and Obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. So I know the Lord is speaking to me. So I go back to tell Cynthia, I think i got to go to YWAM. And hoping that she'd try to talk me out of it. But she didn't. She said, I think you're right, you need to do this. But I thought, okay, I'll, I'll go, but at least we can have the summer together because the team doesn't start till September and, and I can have summer with Cynthia. This was like June or something. And so uh, then what YWAM wrote back and said, you should come and do the Olympic outreach in Munich. This is 1972 because there'll be good teaching there. And I'm thinking, what do I need teaching for? I've been a Christian for eight months. I don't need teaching. I just want to evangelize Europe. But they, they were kind of insistent. And Cynthia said, well, I think you should maybe go. But I knew that I couldn't go un unless I got a passport. I had traveled back to the States on my military ID, and I didn't have a passport. And it was an Olympic summer. I knew it would take many weeks to get a passport. So I thought, fine, I'll just send off for the passport, and then I'll have summer with Cynthia. I send off my passport application to Chicago from downstate Illinois. And three days later, the passport is back in the mail. A brand new completed passport. Now, this is totally impossible. The fear of God came on me because you cannot even get a letter from downstate Illinois to Chicago in three days, much less get a letter back with a completed passport in it. And this is how I know that there's a, that angels do passports. Anyway, I had no more excuses. So went off to the Olympic outreach where my life was changed again. Cynthia and I kept in touch using the latest technology. We were, all our friends were amazed it was called cassette tapes. So we had a two-week turnaround on each communication, which was actually, I was thinking about it recently, it's excellent communication. Much better than the, the instantaneous communication we have today by Skype or whatever. Because you had to think very seriously about what you were going to say. You had enough time to say it because you had an hour. But you knew you only had an hour, and it was only it was going to be two weeks before that person would hear from you again. So you thought very carefully about that communication. And we grew a lot closer over that almost a year that I was at the uh, on that team in Karlsruhe in, in West Germany. 
So I won't tell any more stories about that year, but I went back home after the year we got married. I got back home in June. We got married in August of 73. That's when I got to know her family, of course, a lot better. We were preparing the wedding at her dad's uh, summer house in Michigan. We got married in Illinois and uh, worked for a few months and then went to do our school in Lausanne. As a newlywed couple, we were married about five months before we got to Lausanne to do our school in January 74. While we were there in Lausanne, and I don't remember the exact month, I, I think we must have been on staff already. So it may have been the end of 74 or the very beginning of 75. But we were in the reception room at Lausanne and, and we saw a brochure. And it was about a leadership seminar that Lauren was giving Joy Dawson and Campbell McAlpine in St. Louis. And St. Louis is about a four hour drive or five at that time um, from our hometown in eastern Illinois. And Howard had been asking us to send him any any materials we could on Christian leadership. So we, I remember we sent him the book of uh, J. Oswald Sanders on, on Christian leadership. But we saw this seminar brochure and we knew we had to send it to Howard. And we knew it was just crazy because for one thing, back then uh, getting enough money for an airmail stamp was a, was a faith challenge for us. But the other thing is Howard was at the height of his professional career at that time. He was in his early 50s. He had, um, he was a very well-known research scientist in his field, which was spectroscopy, which is the study of light. He had several patents for different things he had invented. And he had, he had published in 1962 this book, Electronics for Scientists. I think this is the first edition. This is the copy he had in his personal library. Um, he was the leader of, one of the main leaders of the revolution in, chi in, in science that went from analog instrumentation to digital instrumentation. And there were a lot of problems with that transition because scientists didn't know electronics. And they were asking to be taught electronics at different universities and the universities were saying, well you have to come and get a master's for three years in electronics before you can design your own instruments. And, and they were saying there's no way we can take three years off from our field and just go learn electronics. But Howard started in 1960 teaching scientists how to build their own instruments in a three-week, very intense seminar at the University of Illinois. He came on this model of what we now call modular learning when he was in the Navy. And the, the USA, in that time of war, World War II, gathered several of the brightest young scientists they could find and flew them to MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, which was and still is the top technology university probably in the world, certainly in America. Um, because in the Pacific we were facing many ships being sunk by kamikaze attacks these little planes which were filled with bombs and then their suicide pilots would fly them into the ships and they could sink an aircraft carrier. Just one or two of these tiny little aircraft. But there had been a new invention in England called radar, which they knew could help them locate these attacks coming from much further away than they could be seen with the naked eye. So there was this huge push to get this technology in a form where it could be used on the ships in the Pacific. And they decided to do it in this super intense seminar format because people were dying out there. It was a matter of life and death. So that's the urgency they put on these young scientists. 
you guys have to learn this and get it out there to those ships because people are dying and they will die until you get this done. So in that, in that uh, wartime intensity emergency atmosphere, they learned electronics and they learned it, I don't remember the exact time he was there, but it was a few weeks time. So when he got out of the Navy and then went back to the university world, he was way ahead of everyone else in his understanding of electronics and how they work and how they could really help shape the instrumentation and, the, and help the scientific discoveries that were just popping in the, in the late 50s and 60s. So when, uh, when he realized the need of, uh, of, of scientists to really understand electronics a lot better, he set up a course which originally ran like one day a week for 15 weeks over a semester period and got his students to do just that for one day a week. But then he realized he could put it together in a three-week period, 15 days, in a summer, and that's what he did in the summer of 1960. So he, he had come out of this background of intense modular education where you could learn a whole lot about one subject and one subject alone if you concentrated on it and worked hard for those three weeks. Anyway, we had this burden on us, Cynthia and I, to send this brochure to Howard about this leadership seminar in St. Louis because uh, there was, we knew it was hugely important for him to meet Lauren and we had no idea why, none. The university was not being shared about. Uh, Howard we knew it would take a miracle for him to get free for a long weekend. He was so much in demand. But the miracle happened. He went out there, went to the seminar, heard Lauren speaking about modular education, and went up to Lauren after the message and said, I just want to let you know you're on the right track. I do modular education for scientists, and I know that it works. And Lauren was shocked because he had never had anyone in education tell him that modular would work. They all told him the contrary, including his brother-in-law, who was one of the top administrators in the Los Angeles public school system. So Howard was the first educator who'd ever told him, yes, this is a great way to go. And so all he, he, all he could do was say thank you. And then uh, a couple hours later, he realized, hey, God is in this. I've got to talk to this man. So they sat down together, really hit it off, and started building a relationship. Then Cynthia and I got this prayer burden that, that Howard should do a DTS. And that was even more impossible. He'd have to convince his wife to go to Hawaii as well. And, um, but he did. He got free in the summer of 1977, I think it was, and did his DTS that autumn. Before that, um, it might have been 76, could have been late 75, he'd received an invitation, three invitations, to be president of three different American universities because he was such a well-known figure in science and research and also very personable, beautiful smile, loved people. And he was holding these invitations before the Lord and saying, Lord, do I accept any of these? Not really wanting the job of president because that's a fundraising thing in American universities. But he was submitting his life to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to him very clearly and said, no, you're not to accept any of these because I'm giving YWAM a university and you're to be the first provost. So he said, yes, Lord. Made an appointment to visit Lauren as soon as he could. Flew out to Kona. They had just moved on to the Kona campus, this old falling down tourist hotel that was only actually still standing because the, the termites were holding hands. And Lauren had two chairs in his apartment. That was his entire furniture. You may have heard him tell this part of the story. And he was going to tell Howard that he just received this amazing word from the Lord that YOM is going to have a university and to invite Howard to be part of it some way. So um, he is thinking, God, how am I going to share this with this world-famous scientist 
I don't even have furniture in my apartment in this place. And this is to be the birthplace of a university. And God said, just share. So he shared. And I need to ask Lauren if God told him that Howard was to be the first provost. Because most people don't know what a provost is <laughs> or why you need one. <laughs> and I wonder if Lauren did at that time. He might have since he's had a master's degree in education. Anyway, he gets up his courage, tells Howard, Howard, the Lord's told us he's going to give us a university. And Howard said, I know, and he's told me I'm to be the first provost. And that was how these two amazing men, completely exceptional, each in their own field, were put together by God to begin first the Pacific and Asia Christian University, and then it was... We got the name, I got the name, first of all, in 1988, that it should be called University of the Nations and not bound to one region of the earth only. But that's another story. Anyway, one of the lessons that I take away from, from this, this story is how important our small obediences can be and how many times I could have missed it in this story. Um, now, if I had blown it and disobeyed God in some way, the Lord would have had some other way of bringing Lauren and Howard together. It, it might have taken longer because the Lord's plans can never be stopped, but they can be delayed, and they are delayed by our disobedience. But the, the way that it got going as soon as it did was um, the small obediences, inviting Howard and Carolyn to our Bible study, going to church that evening and meeting Cynthia. What if I had, hadn't gone to church? What if I'd stopped going to that church and hadn't even ever met her? Um, sending that little brochure, which seemed like so impossible, why would we waste the money on a stamp? Um, praying and praying day after day after day with this huge burden that Lauren and Howard would meet. I could have missed any of those at any turn because, and I had no idea of the stakes involved. And this is wh what I conclude is that there's no obedience too small to be important because we do not know the implications of that obedience or disobedience. If I had not gone back to, if I had not gone to do that evangelism team in 72, and then gone back to YWAM and do the school in 74 with Cynthia, I, I hate even to imagine what my, what my life would have been like. There is no obedience too small for the Lord to use. And some of our small obediences may be the, the steps on the way to something huge, such as the University of the Nations, which is blessing many thousands of students a year, many more thousands of staff, and multiplied thousands of those affected by the outreaches every day of the year when we have two to 3,000 people out there on outreaches somewhere in the world. So I want to encourage you in your steps of small obedience. There is none that is too small for the Lord to notice or to use. Let me just finish by saying a couple more words about Howard. Um, the son of an associate of ours, Dr. Doug Fever, wrote a biography of Howard, this is John Fever, called Into the Light. And I just talked to this, this last month to another YWAM leader who had read the book for the first time. And most YWAM leaders, when they read this, they say, every one of our staff should read this book, every one of our staff and students. And I, and I tend to agree. Um, it's hard to legislate something like that. But I just want to encourage you to get the book. There's usually a, an old copy floating around Amazon for free. Um, but he was an exceptional, exceptional man. And I want to just repeat the lessons he learned in his life that he built into the very foundations of the University of the Nations. 
One is that our education is not just for your career and to get a good job. Our education is because people are dying out there. And we can bring life to people, to communities, to neighborhoods, because of what God has given us to do. So that means there's an intensity to the way we study. When we study in the modular format, which means studying one thing and studying it deeply for a, a very short period of time, in our case, usually 12 weeks, but we can have like six week seminars too. Because we're always seeing in YWAM, people wanna, wanna do like their traditional university and, and, oh, let's have a school where we do some leadership and some counseling and some fundraising and some this and some that. And they try to put all this stuff together where what the Lord has given us, through Howard and Lauren, both of them had this, was modular education. Modular education. The intensity of it. Going deep into one subject. The other thing how, which is very important for Howard was team. He would grade his doctoral students, some of whom were not Christians at all. Part of their grade in the course and postdoctoral would be teamwork. Could they work with others? In other words, he was grading him on what we call character quality. But he saw that as so important in the scientific enterprise. One scientist wrote about him after his death that his field, inorganic chemistry, was totally different in, in attitude than other branches of chemistry because of Howard's example. In other branches of chemistry, there was intense competition. It was cutthroat you would destroy your, your competitor if you could. But Howard was all about building people up and including them and making everyone succeed. It was a rare, rare thing in the scientific world. The other principle that he showed us through his life was the principle of excellence crucified. When I was doing my master's degree at the seminary in Illinois, they talked about excellence a lot. We want to be excellent. We want our students to be excellent. Our faculty is excellent. Excellence, excellence, excellence. And they can tell you to the dollar how much their degree is worth, how much their graduates make in each field they train them in. And they do excellent stuff. There's no doubt about it. But this bothered me back then. And I was thinking, why, why am I being bothered with this emphasis on excellence? Because they would quote the verse that Jesus is excellent. So we want to be excellent like Jesus is excellent. I couldn't figure out why I was so troubled by this. And I asked the Lord, and, and he showed me something. He said, he showed me Jesus took his excellence to the cross. And he gave his excellence. He gave up his life. He was broken so that many could be fed. And this is my goal for the University of the Nations, inspired by Howard. We, we do desire to be excellent, and we have some excellent schools and degree programs that bear much fruit. But our, our ultimate desire is to see that excellence crucified, see our graduates take that out to places where no one else wants to go, into communities where no one's doing anything helpful, and take it out into those places take the excellent things they have learned and the excellent people they have become and just allow it to be broken so that the multitude can be fed. This is what Howard Malmsted did with his excellence. He could have had a much higher profile title. He could have had a much higher salary. He sacrificed a huge amount of his lifetime's earnings coming into YWAM at, in his mid-50s. He could have done all that. He could have had much more fame scientific renown, many more publications than he did. But he took his excellence to the cross and allowed Jesus to crucify it and to lead him in another way that has led to blessing for so many thousands and multiplied thousands of people. So we thank the Lord for Howard's example. And I pray that we will never forget the lessons that he taught us.